The Vape Passion Show, episode 30. Hey guys, welcome back to the Vape Passion Show. This is episode 30. I'm recording this on Friday, August 19th. Uh, a little bit earlier than usual. I usually try and record on Saturday e evening or Sunday, just in case any news stories come in. But I have to record a little earlier this time because this weekend I'm going to my sister-in-law's house. Um, we'll be staying there for the weekend, and I won't have the ability to record or read w much news over the weekend. So, But it should be a lot of fun because she just recently bought uh, a pretty expensive... VR system. I think it's on her computer, so that should be a lot of fun. As for any new products that I've gotten in, I only got one thing in, and uh, this is from Strawberry Queen. Really nice packaging. I've actually tried this stuff at a convention that I went to a few months ago, and the packaging is, is great. It comes in like a strawberry container. It's got a net here. Oh, it smells good. I, at the convention, I tried this at, I loved it. Every single one of their flavors, they have four flavors and all four of them are strawberry flavors and uh, different variations of strawberry. And they're just really good. And uh, I reached out to them and asked if I could do this, do a review for them. And uh, the owner, she agreed. So she sent me over these bottles and I haven't had a chance to, to do a review for them yet, but I, I really can't wait. Also, I, I've had a chance to review two of the three bottles that G Vapor sent me and uh, these guys are a budget brand and I've really liked them. Uh, the two that I've tried so far are really really good so I'm excited to try this last one here it's blackberry yogurt I've been saving it for last because I really like yogurt flavors and I always save the best for last so I can't wait to do that one and really that's it for me so let's just get right into the news so the first story I want to talk about here is he's a reviewer named Zach goes by vaping moderation on YouTube and he lives in Louisiana. If you don't know, they had some major flooding, and I think something like 40,000 people are now out of their homes. He was one of those people who lost their homes. It was totally flooded, and he mentions in his video that he actually does have flood insurance, which is great because I was reading something like 42% of people in Louisiana don't have flood insurance, and a lot of the people that actually lost their homes were in areas that weren't expected to see flooding, areas that have never never flooded before. So most of those people don't have flood insurance, so it really, really sucks for those people. And uh, anyway, Zach, he put up a GoFundMe page to help recover some funds to help him get back on his feet because, you know, he has a, a wife and a, a few kids, and uh, his youngest, one-year-old, is in the hospital right now for something unrelated. And But anyway, he's just, you know, he's really having a hard time right now. And uh, I just wanted to mention this GoFundMe page to see if we could get some people to contribute to that. Um, he's, he's asking for 10000 He's at about 8300 at the time of this recording. I'm guessing that he's probably going to meet that by the time you see this video. But I don't know how GoFundMe works. Maybe you can... Uh, donate more than than what he's asking for. For someone to actually record a video on YouTube and ask his subscribers to do that, you know he's got to be in a really bad place right now. So I think anything we can do to help would be much appreciated by him and his family. And like I mentioned, he, there's like 40,000 people who are out of homes right now. And if you can do anything else to help, I'm sure the people of Louisiana would really uh, appreciate that. You can donate to places like American Red Cross, um, the United Way of Southeast Louisiana, Convoy of Hope, or the Baton Rouge Area Foundation. And uh, I'll have some links to those places too on my show notes if you want to look those up. So a really terrible situation for those people over there and um, hopefully they get the help that they need. Okay, so now let's get into some regulatory stuff. So the first article I want to talk about here says that the federal a federal judge rules that label change does not make for a new tobacco product. So this happened on Tuesday, August 16th. A federal judge ruled that the Food and Drug Administration cannot consider that a label change for a tobacco product makes it a new product for regulatory purposes. The judge, Amit Mehta, also ruled that changing the quantity of a product in packaging does constitute a new tobacco product, which will require FDA approval of changes. So this isn't part of the vaping lawsuits happening right now. This was actually a lawsuit put in place by the big three tobacco manufacturers, Altria, Lorillard, and Reynolds American. This was originally put into place in... April of 2015. But now that vaping is considered a tobacco product, this is the, this does benefit e-juice manufacturers. So now manufacturers can actually change the labels without having to worry about filing another PMTA, 
but it's also good to see that a lawsuit against the FDA can work out in our favor. The FDA was sued by tobacco manufacturers, in this case, Big Tobacco, and uh, I don't know how much money they might have thrown into this lawsuit. I don't know if uh, the vaping industry has that kind of money. Hopefully they do. Most likely they don't, but hopefully the lawsuit's happening right now will be favorable like this one is. And while we're on the subject of the lawsuits, the FDA lawsuits, I want to give a little bit of an update to the, the big Right to Be Smoke Free Coalition lawsuit happening right now. The court of Washington, D.C. gave the FDA until August 16th to respond to a statement made by Nico Pure Labs and the Right to Be Smoke Free Coalition. And they did. They responded with a 102-page document describing their position with regard to its deeming rules. This document contains arguments that the FDA considers relevant in this case. I'm looking at a, uh, an article from vapingpost.com, and they list the summary. I haven't read it myself. It's uh, very long, and I just don't have time to read it right now. Um, but the summary here says that the FDA's arguments are that e-cigarettes and their components and parts are properly regulated under the Tobacco Control Act. The FDA rationally explained why it deemed e-cigarettes subject to the Tobacco Control Act and its decision is amply supported by the record. There is no basis to second-guess the FDA's determination that the benefits of the deeming rule justify its cost. The FDA in any event fully complied with the Regulatory Flexibility Act. The Tobacco Control Act comports with substantive due process and the deeming rule is consistent with the First Amendment. So these are all things that the Right to Be Smoke Free Coalition and NicoPure said the FDA did not comply with. So basically the FDA is saying that they did comply with it. A hearing is scheduled for October 19th at 10 a.m. at the District Court of Washington, D.C. So that's when we'll probably start getting a little bit more news on this lawsuit. All right, so now I wanna talk a little bit more about the online age verification stuff happening. So with the deeming regulations, I mentioned this in the last week's show, but all vendors now have to use age verification. Most people are using three different services, BlueCheck, Veritad, and EVS, which stands for, I, I, I can't remember now, Electronic Verification Systems, something like that. Anyway, Vape Juice, they just sent me an email that mentioned that they, they were using BlueCheck and it doesn't work. In this email, they say that the technology doesn't quite seem to be there to fully support proper age verification techniques. BlueCheck doesn't offer any support options for vendors or consumers other than a ticket system, which doesn't appear to get checked. So after 72 hours of running BlueCheck, VapeJuice found that the BlueCheck plugin is easily bypassed by simply closing the plugin, allowing customers to check out without providing age verification. Customers over the age of 27 are still being prompted for photo identification. International customers are occasionally being prompted for photo identif identification. Verification time is supposed to be 20 seconds. However, some customers have reported having to wait up to 36 hours for SMS verification codes. There's no way to complete age verification without a mobile telephone, which many customers do not have. And for many customers, there are several assorted errors that prevent checkout, even after successfully completing the age verification process. They say here that the next largest age verification provider available only has a 60% match rate for age, ver age verification data. They don't mention which provider that is. I'm assuming it's either EVS or Veritad, but they say that because there's no better option right now so they're actually not going to use any verification software, at least not a third-party age verification software. I saw on a forum, I think it was Reddit, where they were talking a little bit more about this. Someone was asking them questions. Uh, another vendor was asking them, so what are they going to do? And I think they mentioned something about their credit card, their processing company, uh, has verification built in. And uh, I, I'm assuming that's going to be good enough. So... Yeah, so they're not going to use any third-party age verification, so uh, really interesting to see Bape Juice's thoughts on that one. And another thing that the re deeming regulations required, I believe it was the deeming regulations, actually it might have been the Child Nicotine uh, Poisoning Act or whatever it was. Anyway, FDA requirements for labeling now require that warnings on bottles be in a larger font size. I was listening to the Let's Vape podcast uh, with Vaping Vic and Joe Cloudy on iTunes, and uh, Cloudy, he was mentioning that the new requirements require that labels now have a 12-point font, and 12-point font is actually very large. According to Cloudy, that would be about the size of, uh, or larger than the print you see in a newspaper. So if you can imagine trying to fit an entire nicotine warning on a, on a label, 
in, in that large a font, an entire 15 mil bottle label would be a warning pretty much. So I would imagine that a lot of people are now gonna stop making 15 mil bottles simply for that reason. One example is Level Up Vapor. They are now getting rid of all of their 15 mil bottles at a discount, a steep discount. They're pro probably gonna be gone by the time you listen to this episode, but they mention here that they just can't fit that much stuff on a 15 mil label. So they're getting rid of all of their stock of 15 mil bottles. So it's gonna be pretty interesting to see anyone who does keep a 15 mil bottle and adheres to the FDA's requirements for labeling. I'm, I'm really interested to see what those labels look like. And then I got an email from CASA and uh, they're asking everyone to support Senator Ron Johnson, simply sending you know an, an email to him or a letter thanking him for what he's doing to help the industry. He, if you don't, if you haven't heard, he's been sending letters to the FDA requesting to see things like their calculations regarding the number of vapor businesses that would be forced to close as a result of the deeming rule and other things like why they made the decisions that they did in those deeming regulations without really having much evidence behind it. So he's really been a, a big help to the, to the everything going on with the vaping deeming regulations. If you live outside of Wisconsin, because that's where he is a senator, you have to write a letter by hand. If you live in Wisconsin, you can go to CASA's website and simply send him an email through their system. But CASA does have, CASA does have a pre-written letter that you can print out and send, and uh, they list his address here so you can send it to him. Okay, and now some unfortunate news for people in the Navy. They're considering an e-cigarette ban among safety concerns. So NavyTimes.com published an article that talks about a memo that went out on August 11th saying that the Naval Safety Center detailed growing safety concerns about exploding batteries in devices that have led to dozens of injuries since 2015. So the memo says that when lithium ion batteries overheat, the seal surrounding them can fail and turn an e-cigarette into a small bomb. The memo also says that the Naval Safety Center concludes that these devices pose a significant and unacceptable risk to Navy personnel, facilities, submarines, ships, vessels, and aircraft. And then they go on to recommend a full ban of products on all Navy property. Navy leadership is now weighing in on this and things aren't looking good, but hopefully that that leadership does consider everything and makes at least some reasonable regulations rather than just full out banning it. All right, now let's talk about some new products on the market. I saw a press release from Vapex, Vapex, I don't know how you say their name. Next Generation Labs and Vapex have partnered to create a device that's designed to only work with Next Generation Labs nicotine. So this is a connected device that can operate across both an open and closed system. So somehow this system is going to be able to detect what kind of e-juice you're using. They say there's smart technology embedded in Vapix powered devices that will only work with TFN brands, TFN being a brand of Next Generation Labs. They're saying that this new product disassociates them from traditional vaping devices that are intended to be used with tobacco-derived nicotine because Next Generation Labs TFN nicotine is a synthetic nicotine, not derived from tobacco. So these vaporizers will have technology embedded into the device and e-liquid labels and packaging, as well as an encoded cartridge chip technology that stores product file information to identify the type of liquid that can determine consumption and authenticate usage permissions. Once the device is enabled with an appropriate label, consumers are then given control via a smartphone app, enabling customization of a variety of features from atomizer configuration, liquid consumption, puff rates and temperature readings, to product safety controls, haptic feedback, a device locator, and more. So that is a very crazy product. Personally, I'm not really a fan of it. I think it's just way too restrictive. Uh, why would you make it so that it can only work with a certain type of e-juice? I'm guessing this might have something to do with trying to distance themselves from the FDA regulations. Uh, I see here that they also hope that aligns them closer to the pharmaceutical industry. So maybe this is their way of trying to get in as a cessation product. I don't know if that would be the case, if it actually worked to uh, help them get an approved product for cessation. I think that would be pretty cool, but I really don't see this being very successful otherwise because people are, don't want to be locked into one e-juice, but a very interesting technology. There's nothing here about when it launches or anything like that. It just says coming soon but we'll see. Uh, all right, the next one I want to talk about here is the Kanger Drip Easy 80 Watt Starter Kit. So it's a dripping atomizer. And really the only reason I wanted to bring this up is because of how crazy this device looks. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen anything like this. It actually kind of reminds me of a lot of, if you, if you go on 
Pinterest and you look up all of the steampunk stuff you see on Pinterest, if you if you have an account on Pinterest, you probably will probably see that all the time. There's a lot of really cool steampunk stuff, and this actually reminds me of it. Uh, other except for that, it's black, but it's a very unique looking device. I have no idea how it performs or even if it's any good. Um, I'm not really a big fan of Kanger products. I think they look great, but performance isn't always very good. I have the K-Box 200, which has a, it, it looks great and it feels good too, but it had a two second, something like a two second delay on firing, which I, I just can't stand. This one is 80 watts. I've heard that people on the, on the lower wattage devices, people don't have that issue. So I don't know. And a lot of people really do like Kanger Tech products. So this one might be worth trying out, but uh, so so crazy looking. It's like a it has a juice pump that pumps e juice into the RDA. It's kind of like a squonker style, but it has a visible tube, so you can see the e juice pumping into the RDA. The first thought that comes to my mind when looking at some of these pictures is that that those tubes and the pump are going to get clogged and are they're going to be a pain to clean. But you know I I can't say for sure. But to be honest, I kind of want one because of just how cool it looks. You can get them for, it looks like $55, so not too bad. And it says here that they're only on pre-order right now, and they will be available in either black or silver, and the estimated arrival date will be late August. All right, now let's talk about some health and research stuff. So this next article I want to talk about is from OxfordJournals.org. This is a study titled, Exposure to Nicotine and Selected Toxicants in Cigarette Smokers Who Switched to electronic cigarettes. So they measured seven nicotine metabolites and 17 tobacco smoke exposure biomarkers in the urine samples of 20 smokers collected before and after switching to a pen style e-cigarette for two weeks. These biomarkers were metabolites of 13 major carcinogens and toxicants in cigarette smoke. The results of that study showed that 45% of the participants reported complete abstinence from cigarette smoking at two weeks while 55% reported continuing smoking. Levels of total nicotine did not change after switching from tobacco to e-cigarettes, but all other biomarkers significantly decreased after one week of using e-cigarettes. So from, from what we know about ingredients in electronic cigarettes, or, or in e-juice, nicotine really isn't a problem. It, it, there's nothing wrong with having nicotine in your system. It's pretty much unavoidable. Um, if you eat tomatoes or eggplant or anything like that, nicotine is in a lot of vegetables, nightshade plants. So there's nothing wrong with having nicotine in your system, but you do want to avoid the toxins that are in cigarettes, the carcinogenic ingredients. This study concluded that after switching from tobacco to e-cigarettes, those carcinogens were substantially reduced. So very good pro-vaping study. All right, this next one I want to talk about is from Dr. Siegel on tobaccoanalysis.blogspot.com. It's titled, John Hop John's Hopkins Physician and Vaping Opponent Urges Parents to Lie to Their Kids About the Hazards of Smoking. So a physician with John Hopkins All Children's Hospital published a post urging parents to downplay the hazards of smoking so that kids will think that vaping is just as dangerous as smoking. Some of the things that this post said were things like, e-cigarettes may appear to be safer way to smoke, but they are just as dangerous for children. Scientists are just beginning to see the dangerous effects of vaping, such as cancer. Most importantly, parents should talk to their children about the dangers and harmful side effects of e-cigarettes and other drugs. And parents should also consider vaping just as dangerous as smoking cigarettes when talking to their teens about the dangers of tobacco use and smoking. So first of all, there's no research showing that vaping might cause cancer. That is just a complete lie. These quotes come from Dr. Rachel Dawkins. Another thing that Dr. Rachel Dawkins said was that parents should consider vaping just as dangerous as smoking cigarettes. So there are two really big problems with this statement. One problem is that there's plenty of evidence that shows that vaping is much safer than smoking. If parents tell their kids that vaping and smoking are the same risk, kids might think that smoking is not all that harmful. And two, by claiming that vaping is just as dangerous as smoking, kids who might end up smoking later in life anyway might actually turn to smoking rather than vaping because they might not believe that vaping is safer. It's just not right to lie to kids about the hazards of vaping just to try to prevent them from vaping. This kind of advice can be very dangerous and absolutely should not be something that a health practitioner should be supporting. All right, this next one I want to talk about was actually an article sent in from one of my subscribers, Bob. He's always commenting on my videos and he sent me a few articles in the past. A uh, really nice guy. And this one is titled, an interview with nicotine expert Dr. Jacques Le Huzek on e-liquid storage, safety, and more. So this one was actually written in late 2013, but I, I still wanted to bring it up because 
it's a, a lot of the stuff is still very relevant. I'm not going to go through the whole interview, but I'm going to talk about some of the things that he said and I'm, that I thought were notable. Um, so according to some evidence from surveys of e-cig users, vapors feel less dependent on nicotine from e-cigs than they used to be from smoking. Nicotine hasn't been tested in a clinical study to see how addictive it is, but it has been tested in depression or Parkinson's, and it didn't seem to create an appetite for nicotine in these people. We know that other substances in tobacco smoke probably act in synergy with nicotine and make it more addictive. The claims about the dangers of nicotine are probably inaccurate. The most recent case reported an ingestion of 1,500 milligrams of nicotine with no fatal issues. And also a, re a review paper from Bernd Mayer, an Austrian pharmacologist, stated that the actual lethal dose is at least 500 to 1,000 milligrams. When you inhale nicotine with cigarettes or e-cigarettes, there's no concern of overdosing because smokers and vapors know when they've had enough. Nicotine itself is not causing harm. As for long-term effects of inhaling it, we have not seen any adverse effects, but we do have some evidence from a study in rats that exposed them to pure nicotine inhalation for two years, which is equivalent to a human life. The results showed no adverse effects on any organ. The amounts of nicotine released in the air by vapors is very small, if any at all. If there's any danger of nicotine exposure, it's very small. To preserve nicotine, you want to keep it away from light and air as much as possible because that causes nicotine to oxidize, which changes its color, but not its properties. You can keep it in the fridge or freeze it, and nicotine is actually quite stable when frozen, which is actually how it's done in clinical studies. For e-liquids, you want to be more concerned about the flavors because those definitely degrade faster than nicotine does. Old e-liquid can get a peppery taste, likely because the flavors have degraded and all that you can taste at that point is the nicotine, but it's still safe to use. Nicotine is a stimulant, like caffeine, it helps keep you alert. It also has other properties that we know well. There are nicotine receptors everywhere in the body, including the digestive tract, but the most important are in the brain, and they interact with many, many neurotransmitter systems. It has been shown that nicotine can help in many conditions, such as depression, Parkinson's, and schizophrenia. There is always a small amount of impurities, even in the best pharmaceutical grade nicotine, but you'll get more impurities from a non-pharmaceutical grade, so that's why you should only use pharmaceutical grade. And when it comes to synthetic nicotine, nicotine is nicotine wherever it comes from, but tobacco is the plant that produces it in the largest quantities, which is why we use it. It's cheaper that way. So there you go. There's a rundown of everything that he said in the interview. Uh, very useful stuff, very useful tips, and just gives you a really good idea of nicotine, really. All right, and then I got an email from A Billion Lives, the vaping documentary that is not public yet, but uh, they're doing a lot of traveling and showing it in a, a lot of big premieres around the country. And they actually just did one recently, the first North American premiere, and Herman Cain showed up, the former presidential candidate for the Republican Party back in 2012. I didn't know this, but it turns out Herman Cain has a syndicated radio show that has approximately 6 million listeners, so that's pretty huge. He attended that premiere, and uh, I guess he enjoyed it so much that he actually had Aaron Biebert, the creator of the documentary, on as a guest on his show uh, a few days after that premiere. So obviously the show, the movie, had a, a pretty big impact on him. They talked about the documentary and uh, highlighted some very interesting things. Kane, Herman Cain mentioned that nine, 9 million people have quit smoking cigarettes thanks to vaping. So that was really good to hear and good for his listeners to hear. He also mentioned that in Great Britain, they say that e-cigarettes are safe. Yet here in the United States, the government says that they aren't, even though there's no research to back that up. Uh, Herman Cain mentioned that the FDA is hiding behind the excuse that they are more concerned about people getting hooked on tobacco list nicotine when that's not the problem. The problem is helping people to stop smoking. And Cain mentioned that this is another one of those big brother infringement things and that he's going to try to continue to, to try to bring attention to the film. So that was really good news for for this documentary. Reaching six million people, many of which probably know nothing about vaping, I think that is huge. And in other news related to the film, A Billion Lives made an announcement in their most recent email that they're accepting requests for special screenings. They're now saying that if there's enough interest in certain cities, they will do a special screening. Uh, you can submit your information on a form that they've provided. I'll have a link to that in the show notes. In order to get them to come to your city, they need to see, they need to be able to sell at least 100 tickets. If you work with a group within your city and you can purchase all 100 tickets and distribute those uh, to people you know, 
that's one way to do it. Or just, you know, work with your local organizations in getting the word out and trying to get 100 people to commit to buying a ticket. I don't know if GoFundMe would allow something like that, but that's a good place to do it because then you could get people to donate uh, however much a ticket costs, $7 to see a, a, a movie, I don't know. And then if you reach that 100 ticket threshold, then the GoFundMe page will give you the money and then you can distribute the tickets. That might be one good way to do it. It looks like it could be a really good opportunity to finally start getting this movie out to the public. All right, now I wanna talk about this article I saw on vaping360.com. It's titled, Vapors in India Exposed Lies by the Government. So in the Indian state of Karnataka, vaping is illegal. It was announced on June 15th as a response to a study that was supposedly conducted by the government, which now turns out to have not been true. So the health minister at that time told the Times of India that they decided to make this ban based on the recommendation of the Committee on Cancer Prevention. And they went on to explain that that study had been conducted, which showed large numbers of children becoming addicted. Well, an Indian vapor took it upon himself to file a right to information request, which is similar to an American or British freedom of information request, with the government asking for more information on that study. Turns out that they couldn't provide that information. There was no study that was ever done. So the, the health minister and the Indian government pretty much lied. People are wondering now why Karnataka targeted e-cigarettes and then and not doing anything about traditional tobacco. And uh, people are starting to believe that it might actually be something in, related to business interests rather than health concerns. But hopefully with this news, that ban can get reversed. All right, and now I wanna get into some tips. I only have a few this week. Uh, the first one I want to talk about was submitted by Mooch on Reddit. He says, don't use a battery fresh off the charger when competing. So this is for those of you who are doing cloud competitions or you just want to blow huge clouds for whatever reason. So he says that if you want your battery to hit as hard as possible when in a cloud comp, don't use it right off the charger. Take two to three five second pulls just before competing. This warms up the battery a little bit, which lowers its internal resistance. That lower resistance means that there will be less voltage sag and will make your battery hit a little bit harder. Not by much, but there is a, a difference. So you don't want to wait more than a minute or two after taking those warm-up pulls or your battery will have cooled off again. So he mentions here that some batteries re respond better than others and have a greater change in the voltage sag and some barely change at all. But he provided some graphs to show examples from several, several batteries and they show that five second pulls at different discharge current levels show variations in voltage sag. It's not as bad for the pulses that are in between two and five. So your first and second pull will have voltage sag. Your third, fourth, and fifth, not so much. Anything after the fifth, you'll start to see a lot more voltage sag. So yeah, if you're competing, that's a, a pretty useful tip. All right, and this next one I wanna talk about is from tasterjuice.com from Phil Bissardo. So He's published a post recently titled Welcome Vapor Talk Forum. So I actually didn't know that this existed on tasterjuice.com, but in his left sidebar at the very bottom of the page, you can see that he has links to a bunch of different vaping forums. And I had no idea that there was even this many forums. There are 26 forums currently listed. Uh, most of them are for English speakers, but there are also some here that are region or language specific. For example, for the UK, Romania, Germany, and Thailand. Personally, for me, I just stick with Vaping Underground or e-cigarette forum just because there's a lot of regular activity on those forums. But uh, some of these other forums might be pretty good. Uh, I know Planet of the Vapes is a really popular one in the UK. But yeah, if you're looking for some forums to join, check out that list. It's a really useful resource. All right, and the last tip that I have for you this week is some flavor charts. This is from bakeitright.com. This is a fruit pairing chart for bakers. Um, not necessarily for vaping, but you can absolutely use it for vaping. Uh, very cool chart. One of the tips that they have at the top of the page here is, as a rule of thumb, desserts usually only have one or two predominant flavors, and some may have small amounts of additional flavor elements to help support the main flavor combination. Try to avoid combining too many flavors together because that can result in dulling all the flavors and nothing will stand out. So then they provide this chart here that has ideas on compatible flavors used in baking. So just to give you some examples here, say your main ingredient is apple. Well, you could pair it with different types of fruits like blackberry, cranberries, dates, or you can pair it with spices like allspice, sugar, cinnamon. You can pair it with liquors like amaretto, cognac, Grand Marnier, or 
mis miscellaneous ingredients like almonds, bacon, honey, maple syrup, and they have this for all different kinds of main ingredients like apples, apricots, bananas, blackberries, lots of really good stuff here. So this would be really useful for, um, well it could be for pairing ing your e-juices with foods, pairing your e-juices with alcohols, um, or especially for DIYers. If you're trying to come up with an, a new recipe and you are trying to figure out something to, to pair with an apple flavor, an apple base, there's a ton of different ideas here. So yeah, uh, definitely check that out. I think this is especially useful for DIYers and I am definitely booking, bookmarking this one for future use. You could probably come up with a thousand different awesome recipes simply using this chart. All right, so that's all I have for this week. You'll find the show notes for this episode, episode 30 on vapepassion.com. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Vape Passion. I'm also on Facebook. Uh, for podcast listeners, you can catch the video version of this show on YouTube. For YouTube viewers, the podcast version is available on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. If you want to subscribe to my weekly newsletter where I talk about my latest reviews or updates on this show, you can subscribe to that on vapepassion.com. And like always, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to email me at alex at vapepassion.com or just go to my website and find the contact page. All right, so that's going to do it, and I hope to see you all next week.